So we have a koan <clears throat> that involves Hui Neng, the first ancestor in China. No, sixth ancestor, I apologize. And, but a very, very important teacher in our lineage. And Hui Neng's story is that he started out he came to the monastery and he was received by the teacher and he, he was illiterate. Um, he probably came from very poor circumstances, but the teacher saw some spark in him and allowed him into the monastery to work in the, the mill grinding grain. So that even though he was in the monastery with the monks, he was, he was, a pretty obscure character there. Well, when the teacher saw that he was nearing the end of his life and it was time to designate a successor, he decided to have a contest of sorts. And he gave the monks the opportunity to write a verse that reflected their understanding of the Dharma and then and post that on a wall. And the head monk who was the odds on favorite to be the teacher's successor posted a, a kind of a clever verse. I, I actually didn't prepare this this morning. I, 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 it wasn't until just now that I thought I was going to talk about it. And, and Hui Neng saw that verse and he, could, he couldn't even read it. He had to go to another monk and say, what does that say? And the other monk read it to him. And, and Hui Neng said, would you write this verse down for me, a, a verse down for me? And, and the monk said, yes. And Hui Neng dictated a, a verse that was sparkling and clear with understanding, far deeper than what the head monk had put up there. Now the teacher seeing this knew that Wenang was the one who should be his successor, but this was a tricky situation within the politics of the monastery. Because here was this guy, he was this unknown, ignorant guy working in the grain mill and he was going to be picked over the what everyone thought was the clearly designated successor, the head monk. And the teacher knew that there was going to be a lot of jealousy, murderous jealousy, liter quite literally. So what he did is he summoned Hui Neng to his chambers in the middle of the night. And he acknowledged him and he gave him the robe and the bowl, the sign of, of a teacher's authority. And then basically said, get out of here. <laughs> and when he then literally had to flee for his life. But he was pursued. He was pursued by a monk named Mio. Now Myung, monk Mio, was a military man. He had been a general before he came into the monastery. And so his physical strength and so on all was, was far greater than, than Hui Neng's. And he went in pursuit of Hui Neng. And eventually he caught him. And he was in a murderous rage at this point. And what happened next was that Hui Neng took the robe and the bowl down and put them down on a rock and basically said, here, if you want them, take them. Now what happened next is what is the essential point of this story. Monk Mio was unable to pick up the robe and the bowl. 
He could not move them. He could not lift them. And of course, once that happened, he was stunned and he immediately becomes repentant, asks Sui Neng to be his teacher and so on. From there. So, but the, the, so the essential question in this koan is why Monk Mio, this big, strong military guy, could not pick up the robe in the bowl that sort of little skinny Weenang <laughs> was running all over the countryside with. And the answer, as I understand it, is because the robe and the bowl are not just physical objects. They are the manifestation of the Dharma and of teaching the Dharma. And that is never lightweight. That's an awesome responsibility. And in theory, at least, only someone who is ready can take that on, can pick up that robe and that bowl. Just as a, as a sort of an aside, after that, Hui Neng went out and went onward and went to live with a bunch of, of poachers um, in the woods. And while they would spend their days going around setting traps, Hui Neng would go around spending his days releasing the animals <laughs> from the traps. And of course, he became back eventually, and he became, he became a, a great teacher. But to get to the point of this story. So there's times, certainly when I'm teaching, that I really feel the weight of the robe and the bowl. And this is one of those times. You know, it seems that for the past several months, literally every time we get together, there is a new tragedy, a new disaster of some sort. Wars and mass shootings. And now an active attempt to return this country to being a 19th century Christian theocracy or something of that nature. Although I, I know that all of my Christian friends, many of whom are clergy, would not see any of what's going on as having to be a reflection of the teachings of Jesus. So it's not even a Christian theocracy. It's a, it's a, a, a fascist state masquerading as Christianity. So I'm, I'm frequently at a loss to know what to say in these times. We could avoid it all. We could talk about some obscure point of the Dharma. We could try to decipher Dogen. But I, I just don't see that as correct. As I see it, the Dharma must be alive. It's not an ancient document. It's a teaching that must be alive in all of our lives, that must inform our lives, that must guide us and help us in difficult times. that must give us some direction as we face these terrible tragic events and, and disturbing situations. So what is there in this Dharma, in this te teachings 
that fundamentally were created 2,500 years ago that are gonna help us today. That are gonna help us live our lives. Amidst what's basically insanity. As I, as I see it. And I've wrestled with that a little bit the past 24 hours. And the conclusion that I've come up with is no matter what storms are passing, no matter what terrible moment we're in, the Dharma needs to be our anchor. Our anchor so that we don't get swept away and drawn into the anger, the violence, the hatred, the many negative emotions that are driving these things that are happening today. And moreover, that through the Dharma, that we are able to maintain compassion and to be a beacon of compassion to those we encounter, that those surround us. You know, it's so easy to become hateful to become alienated. And I'm saying this from my own experience. I struggle with it. You know, this week I had a realization. It's, when I tell it to you, I say, well, of course, of course, but it was a realization for me. You know, for 40 or 45 years of my life, I've lived in rural places in New England. Surrounded by what I would describe as ordinary people, ordinary people, working class people, middle class people, many people who work with their hands, people who work hard. And in recent years, and especially in the Trump years, I felt completely alienated from those people. And perhaps not without reason. If they knew my views on things, they'd probably hate me. But if I'm allowing that to happen, that alienation to occur, at least on my part, because that's the only part I have any control over, then I'm just playing into the divisiveness, into the separation. So I've realized that no matter how sort of uncomfortable I've got, I've got to turn that around. I've got to be friendly and compassionate and loving, even if somebody has a red MAGA hat on their, on their head. It doesn't mean I have to embrace their, the principles that they do, but I have to embrace their humanity. I have to find the things about them that are likable and that I can respect. And I have to build bonds of openness and trust as best I can. I think that's what the Dharma expects me to do. The Dharma is all about non-separation. It's all about not self and other, but acknowledging that we are all part of one body. Now, does that mean that I have to accept the things that are going on? 
now? In my, nine, in my mind, not at all, quite the contrary. I think the Dharma also expects me to rage when I see injustice. I think it expects me to act and react when I see people being hurt, when I see people's lives being placed in jeopardy. I don't believe that the Dharma says sit quietly by and do zazen and ignore all those things. Quite the contrary, as we open up, as our hearts open up, as we experience compassion, I think we're more compelled than ever to act. So how do we do that? Well, at the most micro level, it starts by my interactions with everybody in my world. How do I treat people? How do I receive people? You know, Peter Harris once made the statement that, you know, you could tell how the Dharma was working in somebody's life by how they treat the person at the checkout counter. I think that's true in all of our interactions. Are we manifesting compassion? And if we have anger, is it anger at the circumstances and not at the people? Can we see through their delusions? to recognize and have compassion for the human being that's underneath those. Because I fear that if we can't, we as a species are doomed. And we as Zen Buddhists, who have the gift of this Dharma, I think that what comes with that is the responsibility to bring that Dharma light into the world, to bring compassion into the world. And moreover, to act, to end suffering. When we are in a time now, now this is my very personal view, and you may not share it, that we can excuse me, that we cannot be spectators. That when we are spectators, we are in fact allowing bad things to happen. You know, we have 70% of this country who believes that women should have a right to choose. And yet right this very day, all over this country, that right is being taken away by 30% of the people. Why? Because of that 70%, most are inactive. And I don't want to attach blame to that. I want to have compassion there too. People have difficult lives, challenging lives. They have jobs, they have families, they have bills to pay. They're concerned about being able to buy gasoline for their vehicles. They're concerned about being able to buy food as the food prices skyrocket. So some of these issues, other issues may not be front and center for them. But for those of us who are paying attention and can pay attention, we therefore, it's even more important. 
that we act and that we act from the place of compassion. We act from the place of opening our hearts. We often act from the place of caring about our fellow beings, not just our fellow human beings, but as in the Lakota expression, all our relations, all our relations, all of the beings in the natural world as well. And it's hard and it's terrifying and it's frustrating. I've done a lot of ranting the last few days. I give myself permission to rant. <laughs> it's better than destroying things. <laughs> but that said, then I have to move beyond that. I have to move beyond to a place of compassion. I need to move beyond to a place of aligning myself with positive changes. I need to align myself with the precepts. I need to align with myself with the workings of compassion. But I, I have no doubt that this is a time of unprecedented challenge in many ways. And the world needs us. The world needs the Dharma. The world needs the light. The world needs compassion. The world needs healing. And the world needs compassionate action. You know, I see some people just giving up. I have people, LGBTQ plus friends who are talking about leaving the country. And I understand their feelings, <laughs> you know, especially the sort of irony that they just had this moment of peace where they could get married, they could, their relationships could be acknowledged. And now that's being torn away or potentially going to be torn away. If they're going to be even more subject to prejudice and violence and discrimination. I under, completely understand their feelings as much as anyone can who's not part of that community. But I feel like that's, at least for me, not an option. I feel like the Dharma doesn't give me permission to run away. As much as I can understand and empathize with that temptation. I think it says I gotta stay, I gotta be engaged. I gotta do whatever I can. I gotta show up from not knowing and bearing witness and responding with compassion and loving kindness. Through all the darkness, through all the difficult circumstances.
this Buddha way wasn't can, <laughs> created for, for easy situations and easy times. If anything, these are exactly the times that this Dharma was created for. helping us to stretch ourselves as human beings, helping us to take on the challenges rather than to run from them, helping us to respond even when we cannot see a positive outcome. You know, the Buddha's way is not based on the outcome, it's based on the process. We are obligated to the extent that we take the Dharma into our hearts to follow that process. And we don't know, we don't know outcomes. We don't know anything. You know, it's our enormous hubris that we think that we know what's going to happen in the next moment, let alone the next week, the next year. Again, I see people giving up, but I don't know that they know the future. I don't know the future. And I don't think I'm responsible for knowing the future. I'm only responsible for acting appropriately in this moment. That is all that we have is this moment. And one thing I do know is if we don't act, if we don't use this moment, the probability of a good act, outcome goes down. You know, I wish there was a nice, pat, easy answer, and there isn't. There was some platitude that I could offer today to make it all sound all right, but there isn't. If you think you're in a mess, we're in a mess right now, I think you're right. But the only way out of that mess is for us to open our hearts or open our minds and to move forward, bringing compassion into our lives and the lives of everybody around us. Thank you. Peter, I just want to say thank you because it's been troubling me. And um, as you said, there's no immediate solution, but it, it helps me process things better knowing some of the points you've discussed. So thank you. You're welcome. And that's the other thing. Well, this is a, one of, you know, we talk about the three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. This is a time when the Sangha treasure shines. You know, we're not in this alone. We don't have these feelings alone. There are others who also care, who also want to, to be open and compassionate and loving. And we can support each other. And that's really critical.
I've um, mentioned that I sort of have this practice of trying to talk to people that have the opposite political view. Some people uh, just I've never, you know, just recently met online and stuff uh, who are Trumpians still. Um, some people are like high school friends even that are Trumpians, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, w one thing I, I notice is that um, the more sort of the bonds of friendship are with a, an individual, sort of the more uh, chance, you know, they'll give the your point of view a chance you know they'll they'll actually s sort of um there's more chance they'll sort of consider it and uh, you know i have actually you know with the part of the thing with with the people who live in the fox news world they have, there's so many things they just don't even know about you know um you know like uh a couple of the Proud Boys apparently said within the uh, hearing of an FBI informant who was embedded with them, you know, th that if they had caught Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi, they would have killed them um, on January 6th. And, and, you know, people who live in Fox News world don't, they, these are facts they don't even know, you know. Um, and sort of though, if you have sort of a bond of friendship, they're, they're more apt to hear this and maybe reflect on it and have their views changed a little bit. Um, you know, but I, I also want to mention though, there, there's, you know, we have this possibility of being kind of arrogant, you know, that our views are the only right views there there was uh an opinion piece in the new york times the other day written by a uh, a woman who was a passionate um pro-life person um you know who explained that um you know the, the the even the very very young fetus has all sorts of potentials and all the complexities of it of, of its life that would emerge as it became a human being and all the all this stuff um, that we who are you know pro abortion rights in her view don't even consider. Um, and, you know, in our information bubbles of MSNBC and stuff, you know, nobody talks about that kind of thing, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's, there are, I sort of feel like, you know, we're sort of in a universe that, that, that our minds have happened to have certain thoughts that align with certain political views and their minds ended up based on the entirety of what has happened and the universe, you know, has it and ended up having these different thoughts. And, you know, it's, it's hard to know. It's, you know, it's sort of arrogant to think that we are automatically the ones who are right. So I, I so I feel like part of communicating with people of the other side is to acknowledge that nobody completely knows and all we can do is like, I do, it does seem like we have to fight for our side, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of complicated, but um, those are some thoughts that I have. Oh, thank you. Here, you know, I, I'm not interested in persuading anybody. I'm not, in, personally, this is my first thing. I'm not interested in having any political discussions or arguments. Uh, my goal, goal is to bypass all that and see if my humanity can touch their humanity in some way. Because I think what you said is absolutely true. You know, that's where we're stuck. We're at this impasse. They're right, we're right, you know, that, uh, you know. And I don't want that. I, I, I'm hoping in my life to bypass that and just acknowledge their humanity, acknowledge their feelings. You know, we tend to cut off 
one another's realities, one another's feelings and invalidate them on both sides. You're right, Gary. You know, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't see that as a worthwhile pursuit, which is not the same thing as saying that I'm not going to take a stand because I am, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, through this whole COVID thing, I've avoided going to jail, but getting there again. <laughs> so, but, but that said, you know, I, on, on, in, in the direct encounters with people, I just want them to see me as a human being and I want to see them as a human being. Because that's what I see as the way out of this whole morass. We may never agree, but if we can acknowledge one another's humanity, we've taken that, that hard edge off of the separation. I sometimes understand this dilemma in terms of boundaries and my larger, become more accepting and um, try to bypass the inclination we run into all the time of people trying to set up boundaries to confine and to restrict. I do. That's my uh, very obese golden retriever, Katie. <laughs> Eight, three hello, hello to Katie. <laughs> she says hello. She also says now that my mic is on that uh, it strikes Katie and I, that um, a lot, all this stuff is, is also uh, primarily due to sort of egoic attachment to being right and to tribalism, like our side is right. Um, Gary, you said, you know, the more social capital you have with somebody, the more bandwidth you have to maybe have them hear your point. I think by and large, well, that's indicative of by and large people don't you know it's like well i'm right and if you if you um come against my point of view that i that i feel defensive and i'm i'm going to attack you so we all have values and and sort of beliefs and and that's divergent obviously the war maybe i don't know is uh just this again attachment to uh I'm right, and and if, if again, if you are not on board with what I'm on, maybe shut it for good. Um, and that's of course it's nonsense. I mean, it, I think we can have divergent values and, and figure it out, but it doesn't seem like it's going that way. Well, I think again, this is a lot of this is when we react to the symbology and not to the person. You know, if if some of my neighbors or someone went to them and said, "Hey, there's somebody down the road who's a progressive who you know goes to to protests and and sits down and you know and all you know all of these things and and, and is fundamentally a socialist and on and on." you know, they would hate me. They'd hate those symbols, those concepts. But if I just say, hey, that's that old man down the road driving around in his pickup truck with his dog. Oh, he's okay. You know, so that's, that's again, that's that thing that I think we have to get past somehow, you know, and, and take the, the right or wrong views out of the
my choir in the background. Can you hear them? And um, one thing that I think I learned this morning is um, talking to women friends, many of whom have media time people fighting sells media time you know and and so there's a way in which consciously or unconsciously they benefit from all these terrible things that are going on um and their agenda is not to help us heal as a society and i'm not saying you know it's not indiv individual reporters whatever, but i'm saying that as an industry that industry thrives on the dissension. It thrives, you know. Oh, we have a new breaking story tonight. Nothing happened. No, that isn't going to sell anything, right? <laughs> the breaking story, you know. Look at, look at on the left. There's a, look at CNN. They finally are stopping this. I understand that every two minutes of every day, breaking news, you know, and. That's what they're selling. That's what they're thriving on. You know? Not on people be, being calm and people being happy and people loving their families. You're not going to look at the media and see much of that. So they're major players in this thing. And then it, through the amplification of the, the social media, you know, these things get wildly distorted. But again, that's why I think we have to come back to people. You know, are there some truly evil people out there? That's a strong word. I believe there are. You know, I think when people know better and are stirring up the dissension, are creating the fights, then I, I see that as evil. When they're doing it for personal gain, for personal benefit, I see that as evil. It's one thing to be, you know, look at those people from January 6th. Most of them were just swept up. You might say they were fools, but they were swept up. They believed what they were being told. They were ginned up to this frenzied pitch by these so-called leaders. And those leaders are the ones that I hold accountable because they know better. They knew what they were doing. They knew they were lying. And for what? For money and power. To me, that's despicable. But so do the poor schmucks who got caught up in it. I've got to have compassion for them. Because, <laughs> you know, but for the grace of God, that could be me. So, you know, the formula that I have been living with for my medical life um, was that when we had problems um, that we gathered to solve in some way, everything else disappeared. We were just there with each other. There was compassion, generosity, surrender, um, creativity, all the good stuff and uh, humanity. There was no question of 
whether one was human and the other was, and we were all in, in it together. And so it seems to me like there's so many problems that confront all of us as human beings, some of which people deny, but um, so many of which are so glaringly obvious to almost all of us and increasingly will be obvious to all of us as people get swept away in a flood or burned down or whatever else is going on every day. It just, it seems that the, the, the key is um, for humanity to flip to commonality in the face of challenges that transcend the, the, the micro stories and that affect all of us. And that is what happened in the office. That's what I saw in my office on a micro level. And I just, I, I, I know that the, the, the uh, humanity can transcend and that uh, common uh, grappling with what are sometimes overwhelming problems um, works for, human, for, for people to, to become our best human. I also understand that at the same time, under those circumstances, people can become, you know, piggy and selfish. But what I experienced is that the, there was a flip to, um, you know, transcending that. That's what I saw for 40 years or whatever. Well, yeah. Well, so in a way, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, in a way, what these times are calling for us to do is to transcend our epigenetic heritage because humanity for a long time depended on clans, bands, tribes, nations, whatever, to survive. And it was me and mine versus you and yours. Okay, that's our, that's our heritage. That's what's gone on for thousands of years. And that just isn't cutting it anymore. And it's not gonna cut it. You know, it's what you're saying. These problems are so vast that we have to not only band together as a nation, but band together as a planet to solve them, right? And that flies in the face of tens, maybe tens of thousands of years of human history. So in a certain sense, we have to, you know, we have to let go of all of that and begin to understand. Again, Zen, one body, we are one body. We are one body, we're not 10,000 tribes. You know, and what happens to anyone, anyone that's hurt, I am hurt. I mean, we have to come to such a radically different understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to live on this planet. That what happens to the rainforest in the Amazon is happening to me. You know, the fact that I've got some land here and I got some trees here and it's very nice. Yeah, that's good. But I can't live on that island. I've got to live on Turtle Island <laughs> with, with everyone and everything. So we're approaching our week off. Don't go too wild. How, are we uh, transitioning to Thursdays at six now, or or is there, a, or is that, a, is that when's that happening? What's that? Uh, when are we transitioning to Thursdays at six? I right, see. So he came late. Should we tell him, or just he, 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 he just suffered? <laughs> Coming late. We we are it we are taking a week hiatus and then returning on the seventh, am I got it right? Of of July will be the first Thursday sit. 
Oh, okay. So I'll see everyone next Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. I could get confused easily enough without your help. Yes, everybody have a, a wonderful fourth. Not my favorite. They started with the fireworks last night and, you know, kind of like somewhat of a reflection of this time. All of a sudden, sitting around last night at nine o'clock, there were these explosions. And, you know, so my mind goes all sorts of places at that point. And then I said, well, maybe it's they've started the fire, the, you know, the blowing up things, fireworks. And, and sure enough, after a while, it was clear that that's what it was because you know that whole thing you know any of us who are pet owners know how well that works and you know there's a there's a um, dharma holder in our lineage who um is a vietnam vet his name is going to escape me now um horrible combat history i won't go with that but anyway he is so disturbed by those fireworks on fourth of july he literally leaves the country he literally will not stay in the United States on the 4th of July weekend, you know? And so who, I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but. Okay, that said, have a good weekend. Don't blow anything up. And we'll see you all in a week and a half. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Okay, everybody be well. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, Willie.